Okay, welcome to episode two of AI TV. My name is Nick Bradshaw, I'm the host, and we're broadcasting live from here in Cape Town. It's a great honor to introduce Dr. Jacques Ludic, who's joining us. And today we're going to be talking about ethics and, and all the topics around ethics and privacy in, in AI. And I think, interesting week, I think we've seen Facebook with a record fine, I think $5 billion about uh, data <coughs> breaches and things like that. Jacques, I think anyone who's in the AI scene right now knows that. Um, ethics and, and privacy and what people are doing with data is a, is a, yeah. is a really important thing. Well, you know, what, what's, your, what's your view on that? Yeah, Nick, I thank you. First of all, it's great to be here in Cape Town with you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I, I think from a Cortex logic or Cortex group perspective, um, we take it very seriously. We want to help transform Africa. We want to help businesses and society thrive in the smart technology era. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, trustworthy AI ethics are critical. It's very, very important. Um, and, I, and I actually participated in a few panel discussions re recently where we're actually discussing this this topic. Um, so it's a very serious topic for us. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, last week I was in Kenya, in Nairobi, and we actually had um, some of the leaders in ethics um, talking about these kind of things. And as a matter of fact, I think Singapore was first with their ethics principles, um, and they actually came out with this, um, they call it FEET. FEET stands for Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency, um, and it was all about promoting FEET in the financial services sector. Um, so they take it serious, and when, when you actually study that, um, you, you see some great foundational framework that, that one can utilize, um, especially if you think about financial services sector and what's at risk there. Um, and just to unpack that, so if you think about fairness, uh, things like just decision making, is it justified? Can you justify it? Um, is it accurate? Um, is there bias? Uh, those type of things. Then obviously ethics, um, are, are you ascribing to the ethics of your company? Um, do you have a board uh, that's looking at ethics um, as well? Uh, from an accountability perspective, there's internal and external accountability. Um, and, you, and they talk about data subjects, <clears throat> and that's the people that's providing the data, and that's the users, is there a way for them to actually uh, uh, get information about the decisions being made? How's my data being utilized? Mm. Um, so, so in Singapore, they're taking very seriously. And, and maybe my final comment there is, that was kind of a foundation also for the European Union, because they obviously, uh, earlier this year, came out with uh, ethics guidelines uh, about trustworthy AI. We can maybe talk about that. And, and I, I think they also um, had an interesting perspective because they actually talked about foundational layer, what's the key requirements, and they more th thought about how to operationalize AI. Um, how to, if you operationalize AI, what does it mean uh, from a trustworthy or ethics perspective? And there's a lot of things to, to delve into that as well. But anyway, yeah. So. Exciting topic, Nick. It's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, people around the world are talking about it. <laughs> now, you, you were an early yeah. pioneer, yes. Jacques, in the in yeah. the '90s. I think certainly here in in, in the 2000s. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah late okay. 90s. I was going to give you a bit more credit there. Um, but <laughs> when you when you set up the company C Sense, I yes. mean, that was very much looking, or it was before AI was uh, a buzzword and yeah. trendy, uh, very much focused on like hardcore early. Uh, machine yeah. learning, and it was, yeah. and you were looking at systems, which I guess uh, you know, uh, mining systems or things, which kind of there was some data involved with it, yeah. um, but it wasn't necessarily people's personal data. Now we've right. moved into the sort of mobile yeah. either yeah. Uh, era, uh, social era. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's huge amounts of data sure. slopping yeah. around. Now yeah. AI in that context, uh, in in the context that you used it, maybe was more benign. But yeah. now we're we're living in this uh, social age, so. What, what, what would you be recommending that, you know, uh, a CIO right now in an enterprise is thinking about deploying this? They've got a lot of data, yeah. a data lake. I mean, what, yeah. what sort of advice would you be giving them? Yeah, so it's, it's, that's a loaded question. There's so many things here. When you just talk about the, the history, I just want to quickly mention, you do get customer-facing applications versus industrial applications. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think for customer-facing type of application, we work with customer data, then things like, uh, privacy of data, uh, and we're going to talk more about that because I think that's a key building block, privacy and data governance. But if you think about the, I think fairness and explicability, can you explain your decisions and stuff is very important. And we did quite a bit of that 
Well, there was not really, it was like the Wild West still at that time. But the industrial world, there's other things from a trustworthy perspective that's important, like safety and robustness. Mm -hmm. And that's also important for, for consumer-facing um, AI kind of solutions. Um, but my, to answer your question, in terms of my advice, you've got to start with uh, the building blocks. So I think uh, you talked about Facebook and privacy. We know that, the, well, that, that is a building block that you got to solve. You've got to make sure that you, you, you address that in a proper, responsible way. Um, in all our customer engagements with enterprises, they ask about privacy, data governance. Um, if, if, you do, if you've got data in the cloud or in a private cloud or on-prem, um, how do you deal with that in a responsible way? So we've got documentation. We, we've got actually policies around those type of things, and we make it available to our customers. And as a matter of fact, also customers in industrial. It's not only our in financial services sector or retail sector. Um, but my advice would be absolutely to get that right. Um, you don't want to mess around with privacy and data governance. Um, and the moment you move above that, then I think you're moving to the machine learning data science space. And then it's transparency and accountability and fairness and those type of things that you want to get into and make sure you get that right. Uh, because if you've got systems that's making predictions and making decisions and judgments and stuff, you want to make sure that you can explain it or you can at least uh, verify and validate that the system is still doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that comes into play. Yeah. Um, and what about things like, um, obviously, once you start building a system that you, clearly AI only works with data, without data, you don't have AI, but without good yeah. data yes. and representative data, you don't, you have you can get bad, bad AI, I think, is really what the scenario we want to avoid. Yes. So again, sampling data, training an algorithm with representative data is, is key. Um, it's interesting, I, when, when I was at the AI for Good Summit, there was also yeah. a group of people working on what was known as a, or, or, a quality mark. Uh, yes. I guess maybe that was similar to feet, but are there any other examples you've seen or come across where maybe regionally there's there's different approaches to this that you know the count if you have a system you know it's got a quality mark so therefore you know it's accurate or have you have you read around that at all yeah so i think it's still the world where there's so many uh, people coming up with solutions and there's there's the AI for good there's 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 all these initiatives the uh, future of life institute they talk about also various things um, but i think when you talk about quality, you talk about, this is very key. If you want any way models that can generalize well, that's what you want. So you want to make sure it's representative and there's models that can generalize well. From a, from a, in the industrial world, one thing that was super important for us, we talked about TVQ, time, time, value, and quality. So with every tag, for every uh, variable, every feature that went into a system, you always check the quality. If you think about what happened with Boeing in terms of 737 MAX and, and a faulty sensor, and data quality went bad. So um, in, in all the systems that we've implemented in the minerals, metals, mining, and the manufacturing space, to implement robust systems, the quality is, is, is an absolutely key factor. Um, so, and you want to make sure in real time that you check the quality. If the quality deteriorates, then, um, then, um, then you want to address it. Um, so I feel there was quite a bit of work done about quality in the industrial space because, because of the robustness and safety of, of systems. Um, it's obviously pretty important for consumer-facing businesses, um, working with structured and unstructured data. Uh, how do you check the quality of unstructured data, um, text, uh, all sorts of things? Maybe with sensors, you know there's drift in the sensor or there's, there's ways of detecting things. You maybe have rules, it goes out of bounds or whatever. But, <clears throat> But I think with, with unstructured text type of data, with just conversations and stuff, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing to, to check. In terms of, um, I think it's still, there's still a lot to be done in terms of quality in general. Um, there's a lot of, my, my, my big problem there is also, you know, about fake news and fake everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so how do you know? As a matter of fact, you get these generative, uh, we get these GAN systems, that's adversarial neural network systems that's, that's trying to, to, to fool the system. You've got systems that are generating stuff and the other system that's pollution, pollution and, and then trying to see is this thing fake or not? Um, and uh, so this, these kind of systems are going to get better and better and better. So it's going to fool us easily. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in, so in terms of quality and stuff, I, we're entering an interesting world. Now, <clears throat> I think another observation is that you've got um, a kind of east versus west 
uh, split with, with, with AI um, in the East. Maybe I'm referring here to the places like Japan or yeah. Southern Korea, South Korea, or yeah, uh, where 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 tech and gadgets are yeah. kind of bread and butter for everyone. Everyone's yeah. happy talking yeah. to a a bot or some some kind of assistant. Obviously, here in the West, we're very much more, I think, pessimistic about it. Uh, yeah. People are saying, you know, is my phone listening to me? Uh, how do I switch it off? Or <laughs> like paranoid? <laughs> it, well, exactly. So we've got the kind of Western world that are in the uh, Terminator death yeah. bot scenario, yeah. and then in the East, you have people seeing yeah. these assistants and AI as a force for good or uh, it yeah. can help me. So yeah. do, do you think East versus West is, is also playing a factor in this, that the exploitation in the East is, is, is uh, happening faster because people are much more accepting of it and they're thinking, well, okay, I'll, uh, I don't mind if they're listening to me because I get lots of extra value, whereas on our side, we're kind of like, oh, I don't want anyone listening to me, so I want to switch this off. What, what? How, how does that play with the ethical debate, do you think? That is an incredible, that's an intriguing question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we're probably going to have a whole session just on that. And I think if you think about Japan, it's almost like there's an easy adoption of, of just humanoids or robots and stuff like that. Mm. And I'm kind of, and I think you recently put something out on uh, Expo on, on do we want our robots to look like this? Yeah, it was a, B, a BBC article. They, they did a, <laughs> yeah. a reporter had written about, um, you know, in, in the East, they're quite happy to have a, a device that helps them that doesn't look like a human, yeah. so like it's an egg or something like that. Whereas yeah. we, we tend to be obsessing around stuff that look like humans. And I think to me, when you try and do that, it looks more unhuman than human. I agree. And yet, if you look at some of the Japanese or yeah. uh, Chinese, Chinese or Southern Korean type devices, they yeah. actually they look more cuddly. They're just like a kind of egg or something like that. And, and like you kind it. of want to talk to it. So, yeah. so I, I think the end user experience yeah. in the West, we're more pessimistic. We're more scared, and a lot of that is to do with ethics and, 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 and privacy. Do, I, do definitely, think? I think it's a cultural thing as well. So there's uh, it, there's no question about it. Um, I, I feel um, there's there's also if you think about um, uh, data privacy, how data has been handled in the East, and 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 so that as well, that comes into play as well. It's also slightly it's different to Europe, where there's a really serious focus on privacy. I want my data protected and mm. stuff. And I see kind of the, uh, the 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 Chinese government is also having a look at those type of things as well. So it's many many different things. So it's definitely clearly in the way data is being handled, um, and I think. It's it's a, maybe a fine balance because in, in China, for instance, with WeChat and the effectiveness of that type of platform, being kind of a universal platform that allows you to do so many things and make your life easier, they may be more acceptable to let it go. And so, yes, this is all the benefits that I'm getting. This is really cool. Um, and we, we don't see exactly those type of systems yet, those kind of super platforms um, in the West. It's more kind of you've got your Facebook and Google and various systems, not everything in one. But but I think the robot thing that you mentioned, the human or able, those, especially in China, in, in Japan and South Korea, uh, it's clearly a different way of looking at it. Um, and I think as, as, as a homo sapiens, we need to get together and we need collective wisdom in terms from an ethical perspective because there's, there's lessons to learn from the West. And, and mm. well, it's kind of for me interesting, maybe we should say, um, the Americas, Europe, and the East, because I feel it's like in, in Europe, they're almost kind of leading ethics and privacy and those type of things, whereas in, 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 in America, it's slightly different. So, so there's some leadership, different types of leadership in this space, but I think we need to work together. It's, uh, we're, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're still a, a human race is getting closer and closer and more and more connected. Um, so I think it's in our best interest if we are this collective wisdom um, are, are treating these type of things. We, we've got a lot to learn from the East. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, so. And it's very interesting. I mean, halfway between the East and the West is Africa. I mean, we're, 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 we're on a very interesting continent right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of very interesting things going on, on yeah. here. I mean, just to wrap up, I mean, yes. I think yeah, we've got a lot of young engineers, young entrepreneurs yes. now emerging out of all sorts of fantastic initiatives across yeah. the continent. We have data science, Nigeria. Sure. Uh, we've got activity in North Africa, yeah. West Africa, East yeah. Africa, Southern Africa now. And yeah. what, what advice would you give from a sort of ethical and uh, privacy perspective to a young engineer who's thinking of developing an algorithm and just starting out on their journey? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, what, what we need to take it seriously. Even even if we're trying to leapfrog here, we're building African solutions uh, for African problems. Um, we still work with data. We still work with people's data. Uh, we're delivering solutions to 
uh, to people. Um, we have to t take responsibility. And uh, I think it's a lot to learn from what's happening in Europe and the East and West and so forth. Um, but we can use the best of that and implement it in our solutions. I'm quite excited about the, the entrepreneurs here. Um, there's an eagerness and willingness to, to create a solution, be very pragmatic and practical in terms of, of our solutions. So, but uh, yeah, my advice is just go for it. Um, learn as much as possible from what's happening elsewhere and implement and be practical and pragmatic. Just start using it, implementing solutions. That's great. <laughs> well, Joe, thanks yeah. very much. It's been I'll great to yeah. uh, <clears throat> chat to you. It's always yeah. fascinating to talk, to talk to you. Also, thank you very much for allowing us to yeah. host uh, AITV in the, in the offices of uh, the Cortex Group today. Yeah. Uh, in episode three, we're going to be joined by Selena Lee, who's the CEO of Zindi, which is an African uh, data science challenge platform. And we look forward to interviewing her next week. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.